forgive me. I feel it again. The pull to the light. Supreme Leader senses it. Show me again the power of the darkness. And I will let nothing stand in our way. Show me. Grandfather. And I will finish what you started. Hello there. A few months ago, I made a bad joke. Shocking, I know. For April Fools this year, I hyped up and released a video called The Highs and Lows of Disney's Star Wars, which not only made it seem like Disney created Star Wars through bad grammar, it also was two minutes of clickbait of the highest order. At the time, I thought it was hilarious, but looking back, I realized that it's a bit lazy as a joke. As well as being a little bit cruel to the people who watch my stuff, I mean, it's not right for me to mock the people who I create content for. Who am I, Stephen Moffat? So here is my formal apology. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment, and I don't expect to be forgiven. I am simply here to apologize. Also, I did the video for real. I will be completely honest with you. There is a not insignificant part of me that does not want to do this video. This is the only video I've ever made where I'm genuinely a little bit terrified to post it because I know that even a quarter of the things that I say in it will be incredibly controversial just because of how inflammatory this topic is. So, much like my High Top Films video, I want to issue a few disclaimers. First of all, and most importantly, these are all opinions. You can dislike all the stuff that I like, and like all the stuff that I dislike, and the world will keep on spinning. Because of this, you are completely free to disagree with me in the comments. In fact, I encourage you. It helps boost my engagement and such. However, a fair warning, I know how nasty stuff can get on the internet when it comes to Star Wars, so if I see any kind of racism, misogyny, general bigotry, or, you know, any kind of toxicity towards me or other people in the comments, I will delete your comment. And if you continue to post, I will permanently ban you from my channel. I take this stuff very, very seriously, and I will not allow it in my community. Now that the serious stuff is out of the way, we should clear up some other important notes. The title of this video refers to the Disney Star Wars era, or some to that effect. This does not include every single Disney property that has been released since Disney acquired Lucasfilm because I am not a masochist. Instead, I've decided to cover every single movie that got a theatrical release and every single Disney Plus original property. I could say that I did that because I wanted to narrow the specification and said I want to get this video out in a somewhat timely manner, but the real reason is that I just don't want to watch Resistance. I'm sorry, I don't. Okay, I think I've covered all our bases. Now for our feature presentation. Before we delve into the complicated jungle that is Disney+, Plus, I think it's best we stick to the roots of this franchise. Or at least like the roots in terms of what media the franchise originated as. Movies. I'm talking about movies. This is the video in the series that will get me crucified. <laughs> bad feeling about this. I remember back in 2015 when I was a small child and The Force Awakens first released. The months and weeks leading up to that release had been almost magical. There was an excitement in the air, a hype, a to me unprecedented level of joyful anticipation that united everyone in the fan base together. It was new, it was exciting, and everyone agreed at the time that it was good. Oh, such simple times. And that positive memory of the film persisted in my mind all those seven years ago since it was released. Until now. Rewatching The Force Awakens, I was expecting to dislike it. I knew that the rose-tinted image I had in my mind couldn't be accurate, and having been fresh off of rewatching The Rise of Skywalker for my fan service video, oh, we'll get to you soon enough. My feelings towards J.J. Abrams were at a low point. Thus, my expectations of The Force Awakens were similarly low. But to my surprise, I still really enjoyed it. It is absolutely not without its flaws, and retroactively a lot of it doesn't really work because of future films. 
one film in particular. But standing on its own, it's actually a pretty good Star Wars movie and a fairly entertaining movie on its own with some interesting ideas. A perfect place to start was with our four main characters, Rey, Finn, Poe, and Kylo Ren. Honestly, these four are the parts of the movie that work the most for me, probably because they're original creations, if somewhat derivative. It goes without saying that all these actors are fantastic and give their all to the material, but the material itself isn't anything to scoff at either. It's hard to remember because of what he became later on, but Kylo Ren in this movie is genuinely pretty intimidating and intriguing. I mean, in the first scene of this movie, he's shown to be a powerful force user. He orders the execution of an entire village of innocents with the command of a powerful stormtrooper army, and all of this is done without breaking a sweat and with very little dialogue spoken. And yeah, he's obviously derivative of Darth Vader, but that's the point. As you learn more about him, you learn that he idolizes Darth Vader and wants to recreate his effect that he had on the galaxy. I will admit that this is really cheesy though, like come on, he couldn't just have a shrine or something? Did it have to be the actual Helmus? But he's also not like Vader, in that he deals with his anger in a way that is much more reminiscent of a moody teenager than a galactic overlord. And that's really effective for the story they're trying to tell. And it's not like he's a non-threat to our main characters either. Without even mentioning that he killed his father with a relatively low level of hesitation, in the final fight in the forests of Starkiller base, he is injured, emotionally disoriented, and the planet is literally crumbling around him, and he still manages to kick Rey and Finn's collective asses. The only reason the two don't become chopped sirloin is because Rey is able to use some of her newly found force powers to fend him off, not beat him, until a canyon literally forms between them. Point is, Ren has a very strong start in this movie as both a villain and an interesting character, considering his parent-child relationship with Leia Organa and Han Solo. A great start that has an interesting conclusion later on. On that note, Finn is also an incredible character, and he might be my favorite person in this movie. Just the concept of a former stormtrooper, a child stolen at birth to become an expendable grunt, only to be given a heavy dose of reality in his first ever battle, and he chooses to leave the First Order for good. That in of itself is one of the most original ideas in the movie, but it doesn't end there. The writers could have easily have gone the route of Finn immediately turning good and joining the Resistance the second he steps out of the First Order ship, but but they don't. Instead, the only reason that Finn gets involved with the Resistance at all is that he releases and saves Poe, a Resistance fighter, and he only does that in order to get a ride away from the First Order. Finn's only interest is getting as far away from the First Order as possible, which, while not particularly heroic, is much more interesting than just becoming a good guy really easy. And it's enhanced by the fact that, towards the end of the movie, he's put himself into strong relationships with people like Rey and, more importantly, Poe. <laughs> that give him a reason to stick around and in the end even fight Kylo Ren, the head of the organization that oppressed him. Though, to be fair, that last part doesn't go particularly well for him. <laughs> Point is, Finn went on an incredible journey in this movie and he had the potential to become one of the best characters in the entire franchise. Now, Poe, to be honest, isn't really much of a character in this movie. He's more of a plot device, albeit a devilishly handsome and charismatic plot device played by Oscar Isaac. I mean, think about it. He gets the map to BB-8, talks smack to Kylo Ren, gets tortured for information, escapes with Finn, goes missing, shows up as a pilot with the Resistance out of nowhere for disappearing for like half the movie, has an incredible amount of chemistry with Finn, <laughs> and then helps blow up Starkiller Base as one of the countless pilots that are flying around. Sure, he does a lot, but none of it is really driven by his character, except for the Finn thing. And so he's cool and all, but not particularly interesting. Hell, BB-8 is more of a character than he is. At least he has character motivations and makes decisions based on those motivations. This isn't really a huge problem since this movie doesn't really need four main characters to actually work, but it is worth mentioning, especially when thinking about Poe in future movies. And of course, the last main original character that we have to talk about is Rey. Now, <laughs> I know it's a bit of an unpopular opinion, but <laughs> I actually really like Rey. 
Not joking, I do. She's a great reinterpretation of the character archetype that Luke Skywalker embodied in the original trilogy. A poor, force-sensitive kid living on a desert planet who wants to do good despite her living circumstances. She spent practically her whole life working for a spaceship junk trader and barely earning enough to scrape together a living while she waits for her family to return to her. And by helping a droid carrying sensitive information, she gets swept up in the conflict and starts to discover the power within herself. That sounded really cliche. She holds onto the past and recoils from the good, new things in her life because they're new and scary. She rejects the idea of joining the Resistance and becoming a Jedi in order to go back to her terrible life on not Tatooine to wait for her non-existent parentage. It's an understandable reason. But then she is captured by Ren, escapes, witnesses him kill Solo, fights him, and then gets a taste of what her life could be. She's pulled around by circumstance throughout the entire movie until at the very end when she realizes what she wants and starts to take ownership of her own life, no longer imprisoned by her fears. It's great. Also, for crying out loud, she is not a Mary Sue. When you use that definition, it just shows me that you don't know what it means. A Mary Sue is a character who literally goes through nothing and the narrative has to bend over backwards to make sure that they are satisfied and completely happy and they never experience any kind of difficulty while achieving incredible success. Rey is not that. She makes quite a lot of very obvious mistakes, especially while flying. But what she does know about engineering and combat makes sense considering that she was an engineer on Jakku, a planet rife with petty crime. She also goes through the journey I described, which is not something that a Mary Sue does by definition. She's a fully realized character and a great addition to the canon. Also, her theme goes pretty hard. Classic John Williams W, am I right? I, I am right. Remember my disclaimer about opinions? That doesn't apply to this specific statement. Now, there were some other main characters that were decidedly not original. I am, of course, referring to the original trio, Han Solo, Leia Organa, and to a certain extent, Luke Skywalker, as well as R2-D2, C-3PO, and Chewbacca. But those last three don't really play a huge part in the story, so I don't really have much to say about them. Now, I wasn't a super big fan of how they used these characters. Leia was pretty okay. I like that she stayed the general of the rebellious movement of the era, but I felt that her relationship with Han kind of degraded for no real narrative purpose. I get that the in-universe reason is because their son grew up to be Kylo Ren and that drove a wedge between them, but personally I think it would have been a lot more interesting to see these two stick together and work through it, seeing the new layers introduced to their dynamic. I think honestly also would have made Han's death a lot more impactful. Also Han reverting back to a life of smuggling just seems like him undoing his character arc in the original trilogy just for the sake of like having a more nostalgic image of him. It doesn't really ruin him or this movie for me and his death still I think works pretty well but it's just worth noting. And of course those are all personal preferences. Though I do have a slightly more serious relation- Seri what? Though I do have a slightly more serious problem with how they handle Luke Skywalker in this movie, or to be more accurate, the idea of Luke Skywalker. The one criticism of this movie that I found myself wholeheartedly agreeing with is its constant mythologizing of the original trilogy's characters and events, to the point where in this movie, a lot of them are literally myths and legends. I feel like it encourages not looking at those movies with a critical eye and recognizing the complexities that are present within plots and people. Especially Luke. Though I suppose when your target audience is people who haven't watched the original trilogy with a critical eye since they were eight years old, I can understand why you made that decision. The point is that this film also goes pretty deep into some other heavy implications, so it's a bit of a weird tone shift. Namely, the characterization of the First Order, while effective, is very, very dark. It's no secret that the Empire was in inspired by, among other things, the imperialistic regime of the Third Reich. As well as the United States, but we're not ready for that conversation, are we? So having the First Order be the next logical step in that evolution by becoming a pretty intimidating military force, with a lot more overt references to those historical regimes, really adds to that. Especially when considering this next genuinely pretty chilling scene. This fierce machine which you have built upon which we stand, will bring an end to the Senate, to their cherished fleet. All remaining systems will bow to the First Order, and will remember this as the last day of the Republic.
This scene is great, and probably the best scene of the First Order in the entire trilogy, just because even though we don't really have a connection to the people being killed as audience members, which is a problem, the fact of how reminiscent it is of multiple real-world events and people is kind of what really gets you and leaves a pit in your stomach. This kind of characterization is really effective and establishes a really menacing tone for the First Order going forward, though it does make a lot of the merchandising weird. Now, I've been giving a lot of praise, but this movie is obviously not perfect. I've already outlined the problems that I have with legacy characters, but I feel that this movie is also a bit too derivative of A New Hope, especially the third act. It's not a ripoff, as some would say, but it definitely is noticeable. There's also a lot of the convenient return of items that were destroyed and or lost in the last movie, Stuff like Darth Vader's helmet and Anakin's slash Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. Snoke is just kind of a generic evil guy, and despite Andy Serkis' performance, he's a lot like Palpatine, but without any of the real charisma yet. I found it very convenient that R2-D2 was supposedly shut off for years and had no intention of turning back on, and that it was possible that he might have the backup for Luke's map stored on his data servers, but it was very likely that he didn't, and then in the end he just turns on and he has it anyway. Like, why say that? that he probably doesn't have it if you're just gonna contradict it later. Just like, just say he has it. And Phasma is a character who is set up but doesn't really have a whole lot of payoff. Though, again, that's the problem for later movies, admittedly. Uh, some other rapid fire thoughts. I like the use of practical alien effects. They're really well done, but they also use CGI really effectively, so having a good balance of those is like, the best you can do in visual effects, I think. The movie has some great looking shots cinematography wise. I particularly really like this weird Dutch angle transition thing. That's pretty cool. I like that Rey and Kylo Ren's motivations are exposed through them invading each other's minds because it makes it a lot more believable than just like saying it. I like well done exposition dumps. Again, all the chemistry between the main characters is palpable. BB is adorable and my favorite part of the entire trilogy. And uh, oh, I really like when they use the Wilhelm screen. Ah, it was fun looking back from this movie, and so far, I don't think I've ever heard too many Star Wars fans. That's going to change. I've got a bad feeling about hey. Quiet. I feel pretty confident in saying that, on a writing level, Rogue One is probably the best Star Wars movie. Wait, hear me out, hear me out. While the original trilogy and some of the other movies are still pretty good, it's no secret that the writing isn't the strongest or most complex. I mean, take A New Hope, the very first Star Wars movie. The story is well-structured and iconic, of course, but it doesn't have the same level of complexity that you would expect in, like, really good movies. All of the main characters are pretty simply good or evil, with the only real main exception being Han Solo. And Han Solo is basically a good guy with, like, some morally gray paint. The worst thing he does is shoot Greedo. And yes, he did shoot first originally. Even Darth Vader, who would go on to have a lot more depth in other installments, is a pretty basic villain here. While later movies improve this, there are rarely any Star Wars movies with more than one morally dubious character. And that character is usually Anakin Skywalker. The prequels suffer from having an interesting story being poorly translated to screen, with some movies being boring and others being messy. The sequels suffer a lot from a lack of planning, which I'll get to. And of course, it's worth mentioning that George Lucas was not great at dialogue. And my line was, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquila or Solus. And what there is is most likely directed towards a large scale assault. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, who talks like this, George? I don't like sound. Rogue One, on the other hand, benefits from not having to set up a sequel or have a full prequel, though we are getting that, because it's not a main part of the original Star Wars saga, it's a Star Wars story. It's its own thing. The full story from beginning to end is told within the confines of the movie, and thus it is able to showcase a well-constructed and crafted story without having to set up anything for future sequels with loose ends and such for different characters. It has its own themes and messages with those characters that are told within the movie's confines. Those themes, characters, and messages all revolving around the story, of how the Rebels stole the Death Star plans. With that seemingly bare premise, the writers had an incredible amount of flexibility as what they could do for the story. And so, they chose to write what was an excellent commentary on morality in the face of injustice, the reality of life under oppression, and hope. Because while the franchise is called Star Wars, this is the only movie that feels like 
a war movie. This movie is dark and gritty and dirty, and you can feel the weight of every morally dubious decision the main characters make in order to survive in a world that is dominated by the Empire. One of the things that this movie does really well is actively tackling the morality of the Rebel Alliance, a force in the original trilogy that was presented as unequivocally good. In reality, and in Rogue One, that's not entirely the case. Because while the Empire are undeniably the villains of the story, there are factions of the Rebellion who start gunfights in an area full of crowded civilians, and others who feel the need to assassinate any and all Empire-employed agents who have connection to the Alliance, regardless of their intentions. Cassian Andor, a rebel agent who is one of the main protagonists of the movie, expresses the fact that he's done horrible things in the name of the Rebellion, and we even get to see this in his very first scene. Calm down. We'll be alright. And it's not just him. The Rebel Alliance has hurt Jin Erso too by causing Saw Gerrera, her stand in father figure, to abandon her at age 16 in order to keep her safe, causing her to live the life of a criminal with no support system. The Rebellion is unorganized and morally dubious, which only serves to further give a contrast to the Empire. Because in this movie, the Empire truly feels like an unstoppable force. They're able to dismantle most conflicts that they get into, and the presentation of the Death Star in this movie makes it a far more formidable formidable and terrifying weapon than it ever was in the original trilogy or Starkiller base was in Force Awakens, despite the fact that it only destroys two cities in this movie, and not planets. It's treated by the narrative like the equivalent of the atomic bomb, especially in its imagery and it only contributes to the power of the Empire, to the point where their influence is the cause of the loss of hope and emotional numbness in Jin. You can stand to see the Imperial flag rain across the galaxy. It's not a problem if you don't look up. That line is powerful, especially when paired with the context of Jin's later actions. She lives in a world where she feels, on an individual level, like she is powerless to stop the horrific things that are happening all around her, which is, uh, pretty relatable. <laughs> but what it also shows is the power of hope in the face of all of that. Time and time again, this movie is telling the story of someone who sacrifices everything just for the smallest bit of hope. Those fighting for the rebellion constantly sacrifice themselves in the hope that the Empire will be brought to its knees. Galen Erso sacrifices his life with his daughter in order to build a purposefully faulty Death Star in the hope that someone would be able to destroy it before it did real damage. The entire crew of Rogue One sacrificed themselves just to get the Death Star plans to the Rebel Alliance, and even this room full of Rebel soldiers who are completely wrecked by Darth Vader are able to get the Death Star plans to Leia, with the hope that she'll be able to deliver it to people who can do something about it. This movie is all about how putting our all into hope can make that hope a reality. In that way, this gritty war movie is kind of beautiful. Despite the Greek tragedy-esque way almost the entire cast dies. A lot of it is fairly poetic. Chirrut, the blind warrior monk, dies in his effort to turn on the control tower, an action he takes out of blind faith. Bodhi, the former Empire pilot who defected to deliver a message, dies in his effort to help deliver the plans. Even Director Krennic, the Empire officer who pushed for and headed the creation of the Death Star throughout all the movie, is the first on the planet Scarif to die by its beam. Hell, this movie is so great at setups that it has literal Chekhov's gun. Why does she get a blaster and I don't? You'll need this. You wanted one, right? Everything in this movie is ultimately tragic. Even the funny comic relief character voiced by Alan Tudyk has a tragic death scene. Climb! Climb! You can still send the plans to the fleet. If they open the shield gate, you can broadcast from the tower. Locking the vault door now. Okay! Goodbye. Hey! With one second left until total shutdown, K2SO chose to mentally simulate an impossible scenario in which Cassie and Andor escaped alive. The simulation pleased him. 
What is wrong with you? I was having a good day until then. The cinematography is phenomenal in this movie. There are so many shots that are burned into my brain, especially when blended with the amazing music. I, I just love this movie so much, you guys. I wholeheartedly think that Rogue One is the best told Star Wars story in any movie, and I will stand by that. And you may think it's controversial, which you'd be right, but, um, <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. All right, everyone. Fasten your butts and hold on to your seatbelts. We're going for a ride. Happy beach here, buddy. Come on. It's a new day. I have a new shirt, and I'm just going to rip off the band-aid real quick. This movie is great, and not only that, it is without a doubt the best movie in the entire sequel trilogy. Wait. Do you hear that? It's the sound of a thousand keyboards being obliterated. Now, I will admit a little bit of bias. I love Ryan Johnson's work. Knives Out is one of my favorite movies, and some of my favorite episodes of Breaking Bad were directed by the guy, so I have a lot of respect for him as a creative. However, I also loved this movie back when I saw it in theaters, way before I knew anything about Ryan Johnson. Now, there was a period of time where, with the combination of the memory going distant and the constant, constant, constant negativity towards the movie online, I thought I disliked it. But then by happenstance, I was able to re-watch The Last Jedi sometime last year, and I realized, oh yeah, I do like this movie. So I want to take the time to explain why this movie is good and what it does well, because quite frankly, it's a bit tiring to see nothing but vitriol for a product that really doesn't deserve it. Again, you're free to disagree with me in the comments, but be warned, again, I will be taking measures to remove explicit toxicity. All right. Let's get it started, shall we? The first thing that is immediately apparent and obvious is that this is a beautiful film. There's so many shots in this movie that even the most hardcore of critics cannot deny are striking and memorable. The use of color and contrast and framing are rather intense for a Star Wars movie, and you kind of realize how little color there is in a lot of the other movies, especially the originals. And that was the sound of me moving up a few more spots on the hit list. The performances are also all superb. Every member of the cast gives their all to this performance. There really aren't any weak points in this cast, especially when it comes to Mark Hamill. Despite the creative differences that he had with Ryan Johnson behind the scenes of the movie, he still gave us all to the material that was written for him, and he does an excellent job portraying it. And also, it's very much worth noting that he did change his mind on the final product once he saw it. It's funny how people forget that part. And of course, as always, the score by John Williams is phenomenal. A musical god, that man. Now, those are the things I can say about this movie without being too controversial, because everything about this movie is controversial, oh my god. So I am going to start with the least controversial hot takes and then slowly ramp it up until I get to the spiciest. So to answer your question, yes, I will be talking about Luke last. Returning to our quadrant of main characters from the last movie, honestly, they're probably the best characterized in this one, with possibly the exception of Finn, but I'll get to that. Rey is definitely at her best in this movie to begin with. In this movie, they move past her fear of change and wanting to wait for her parents to come back by having her discover her power and awaken the want to do good that she had within. Now that's put into jeopardy because of the resurfacing of feelings of inadequacy and self-doubt that come from her being abandoned as a very young child. Deep down, she knows that they aren't coming back, and it's fairly common for abandoned children to internalize the idea that it is their fault that their parents left them, which of course it isn't, but it doesn't change how you feel. So that doubt in addition to Luke's indifference slash fear of her strength, the influences of the dark side cave on the island, and her talks with Kylo Ren, she starts to wonder if she is destined for darkness. This is also represented by her gray outfits, contrasting with her white outfit in The Force Awakens, and representing the conflict between darkness and light that's going on inside of her. In fact, I personally believe that her crusade to try and get Kylo Ren to turn to the light is partially to prove to herself that those struggling with darkness can be turned back. By the end, she helps Kylo save himself from Snoke, but she isn't able to save him from his own darkness. Since he chooses to, instead of joining her, take control of the First Order and try to take over the galaxy on his own terms. That failure brings about a low point in her arc and only worsens the conflict to a point where it could be resolved really well in a future movie. I sure hope that's the case. 
Speaking of Kylo Ren, he's probably one of the most interesting characters in this entire trilogy, and that trend continues with this movie. In The Force Awakens, we got to see the facade that he wanted to project, the evil Darth Vader-esque masked force of nature, with twinges of the real Ben Solo peeking through. This movie removes the mask, both literally and figuratively, to show much of the conflict that's underneath the surface. As it happens, Ben Solo isn't a completely awful person. Well, he's not great, or even good, really. He has murdered countless innocent people just on screen. But it's clear that there's this internal struggle and drive to try and find his own place within the galaxy. So far in his life, he's been indoctrinated by Snoke to turn to the dark side, a turn that was only helped by his perception that Luke was trying to kill him. He has this constant mindset of, Let the past die. Kill it, if you have to. And you can see it in his actions. Whenever he wants to make a change, he kills or tries to kill those associated with his previous life. The other Jedi students, Luke, so he thought, Han, Leia, again, so he thought, and Snoke. He's confused and angry, and he's trying to use his power both in the dark side and over the First Order to try and turn the galaxy into a place that is welcoming to him, a place that won't challenge him, a clean slate. It's why he tries to have Rey join him. Not only is she a powerful threat, but he sees himself in her, or at least, who he used to be. At the end of the day, he's a very, very angry person who feels that he's fallen too deep in, and so he drives himself even further off the deep end. It's a path that leads to self-destruction, and it could be really, really interesting to see where he goes from here and see how this is resolved. I sure hope that that's the case, but out of the four main characters, the one who is absolutely at his best in this movie is Poe, and that's because he's an actual character. Like I said, Poe isn't really a character in The Force Awakens, more like a plot device who has really great chemistry with Finn. I will die on this hill. But in this movie, he's a lot more three-dimensional. He has flaws and motivations. The big one in particular is that he tends to favor being a hero over actually minimizing damage. Now he's not malicious in this, he's just rather reckless and thinks very highly of himself and his heroic ability. When he directly disobeys Leia's orders, resulting in a majority of their fleet being destroyed, he's shocked when he's demoted. When Holdo doesn't reveal her plan to him, he gets agitated and sends Finn and Rose on a reckless mission to infiltrate the First Order. Which is something that ends badly. When he finds out that Holdo is loading up the escape pods, he assumes that she's a coward, and he institutes a mutiny which not only wastes time, but combined with the fact that DJ, who Rose and Finn got involved in Solmus, sells them out to the First Order, results results in a lot of resistance fighters dying, and forces Holdo to sacrifice herself just to buy time to save everyone else. And I know that a lot of people don't like Holdo because... she has purple hair and pronouns. <laughs> But she's much more of a hero than Poe for a majority of the movie. The only time a plan of his succeeds is when he finally prioritizes the Resistance survival and has them escape through tunnels, earning back the respect of Leia. He grows and changes as a character in this movie, and it's really great to see. He has a lot of potential to grow even more in future movies. Boy, I sure hope that that's- And last of the big four, the one that I have the most conflicted feelings about, is Finn. Now, to clear the air, I don't think Finn's arc in this movie is bad, per se? A lot of people say that his arc in this movie is just a repeat of his arc in The Force Awakens, and I can definitely see where they're coming from, but I feel like that there is an important difference. In The Force Awakens, Finn grew from being someone who wanted to save himself to someone who had the taste of how important it was to be a hero. That arc was not complete, though, and the situation in The Last Jedi is a lot more hopeless than the one in The Force Awakens. Even so, he does learn to be heroic fairly early on, completing his arc from The Force Awakens. His main arc in this movie is fairly similar to Poe's, that blind heroism isn't always the best call. His suicide run to destroy the cannon at the end of the movie is just that, a suicide run. He had no idea as to whether ramming the rickety speeder into the battering ram cannon would actually do anything. So Rose took the opportunity to save him the same way that he saved Rey in The Force Awakens. That's how we're gonna win. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. Now this is by no means a perfect arc, I think it's very messy, and I definitely prefer the one in The Force Awakens a lot better. However, it does have merit, and it lays a lot of good groundwork for future movies to work with. I sure hope that that- Speaking of Rose, there are some parts in this movie that aren't handled very well. While I do really like this movie, I will be the first to admit that it's fairly uneven. The much maligned Canto Bite subplot feels like it's part of a completely different movie at times. One that definitely could fit in the world of Star Wars, but feels like it detours from the movie's main plot a little bit. I personally would love to see a movie all about Canto Bite and all the people who live on it and frequent it. It could be a great examination of the war profiteering and the systemic issues 
issues that are present within the Star Wars universe. In general, it just seems like a fun idea to play around with. Here though, it's kind of like a demo level in a video game, like one that advertises another video game that is soon to be released but isn't actually a part of the main game that you have. It's advertising an interesting thing, but it's not a full experience on its own. I do kind of wish they explored Snoke more. He serves his purpose in this movie, and what they do with him isn't at all bad. But, like Finn in the last movie, he's more of a plot device. Though in this case, he just puts Kylo Ren down a bad path. Phasma suffers from a similar problem because I feel like she has a whole lot of potential as a character, especially when working with Finn, and she just died too early. The deleted scene where Finn starts to get some stormtroopers to turn on her would have been a huge improvement. And I'm disappointed that that didn't make the final cut. And yeah, Leia's fake out death is really goofy, but you know, it's, it's Star Wars. Star Wars is goofy, so I don't I don't really care. I think the reason people reacted so negatively to that was because of how recent Carrie Fisher's passing was at the time of the release of this movie, which is absolutely not something that the filmmakers had any way of knowing, so... Hmm. Now, though, we're going to talk about the giant elephant in the room, Luke Skywalker. More specifically, his characterization. I think that in this movie, Luke Skywalker's characterization is a stroke of genius, simply because of what it's trying to say. No, no, wait, hear me out, 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 hear me out! People talk a lot about subverting expectations when it comes to criticizing this movie, and yeah, that's definitely a factor. Extended Universe and Legends content, and even the last movie, had built Luke up to be this, like, all-powerful, messiah Jedi figure who could do no wrong. But the thing is, that story isn't very interesting to tell. Luke falling from grace was something that, in-universe, when you think about it, is very realistic. Luke was a farm boy who grew over the course of three movies into a strong hero, and then he was given the legacy of completely rebuilding the Jedi Order from the ground up, essentially by himself. Luke was a great man, but he's still just a man. And so when he caught a glimpse of the darkness that was instilled by Kylo Ren by Snoke, the most powerful Dark Force user currently alive, he panicked and, for an instant, thought about ending the problem. It passed like a fleeting shadow, and I was left with shame, and with consequence. And the last thing I saw with the eyes of a frightened boy whose master had failed him. He must have thought I was dead. When I came to, the temple was burning. He had vanished with a handful of my students and slaughtered the rest. You'll note that this directly conflicts with the on-screen depiction when Kylo was describing his story, but that's on purpose. These are two different perspectives from the same event. Kylo remembers it as a quick moment where Luke tried to kill him and Kylo was just acting in self-defense. Luke remembers it as a single reckless mistake that pushed a scared boy over the edge and caused the death of all of his students. In one fell swoop, Luke feels like he's destroyed everything that he's been working for. So of course he doesn't feel worthy to carry on the legacy of the Jedi, and he becomes jaded, questioning whether the Jedi Order ever deserved to be legends. And now he's living his last days away from everyone else so that he can never hurt anyone ever again. But the thing is, he's wrong. And the movie knows he's wrong. The Jedi were flawed, obviously, and he is a flawed man, obviously. But that doesn't mean he can't do good. Rey's presence teaches him that there are still people out there like him, people who just genuinely want to do good and help the world. People who rise to counter people like Kylo Ren's existence. And his old master, Yoda, is able to relay one of the best lessons ever taught in this entire franchise. He did my work, not did you? Pass on what you have learned. Strength, mastery, hmm. but weakness, folly, failure also. Yes, failure most of all. The greatest teacher failure is. That was Luke's mistake. He let his failure define him, but he won't anymore. He gives his all to help the Resistance, literally projecting the legendary Luke Skywalker onto the battlefield, invincible, with his original trilogy haircut, to make sure that the legend never dies, and to make sure that I will not be the last Jedi.
God, it's so good. It's so good. Because much like Rogue One, much like the original trilogy, this movie is about hope. Hope in the face of unbeatable odds. Saving what you love from what you hate and not fighting what you hate just for the sake of it. This is why this movie is so good. Well, this and BB-8. And I sincerely hope that I was able to persuade you if you were ambivalent about this before. If not, I absolutely understand, but I hope that you were able to understand why myself and several other people really enjoy this movie as well. Alright, the most controversial part of the video is done, and half the people who are watching probably have already clicked off by now, so let's move on, shall we? I got a really good feeling about this. The next project to get into is Solo. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's going on? Why is TSD suddenly turned British? What's that about? Well, let me stop you right there. I'm not TSD. No, my name's Pillar of Garbage, and I also do a bit of YouTubing. You might recognize me from my ongoing, weirdly controversial video series about how maybe some Star Wars viewers should stop being so racist, or maybe from that one video I did on the mobile game Tiny Tower like a year ago. Who knows? Either way, I'm here to talk about the bastard stepchild of the Disney era. Solo made headlines this year for the first time in a while, but not for great reasons. In the wake of the robot ghost Luke Skywalker's extended cameo in the two Mandalorian episodes Disney Plus weirdly dropped out of nowhere, Lucasfilm came out and said they'd learned a lesson from Solo not to recast beloved characters. Now, I understand that Solo bombed. I understand the urge to distance the studio from any of the decisions made in a film that flopped this hard. But Alden Ehrenreich was great in the role. He's effortlessly charming, he's got the exaggerated swagger of a Corellian teen down to a T, and there's some real range here. We get to see his hands scared, we get to see him smug, we get to see him on top of the world, we get to see him heartbroken, and everything in between. Oh, and by the way, I'm British, we tend to say Han here, not Han. Sorry about that. And in these intense moments, like when Han's torn away from Kira, we see this fascinating window into the heart of Han Solo. That's a sight we didn't see too much back in the OT. But this is a vision of everyone's favorite scoundrel before he got all crusted up with Harrison Fordian apathy. He also nails Han's diction, check it out. What's the last time you could say that? <laughs> Been a while for me too. That sounds just like Ford's 70s Han, just a little higher pitched. That's impressive. Also impressive is the sense of confidence in Ehrenreich's performance. It's that classic Han confidence, but also not quite. It's shakier. At this point, this confidence isn't easy or natural for Han. It's a facade he's hiding behind, one we see slip from time to time. And this facade is flimsy enough that other people, other characters, see through it too. As the film progresses though, we see him learn to control and manipulate this facade and to use this facade to manipulate other facades. That's awesome. And it's great that Ehrenreich can give us all of this in a role so heavy with expectation. And it's a real shame that we probably won't see it again, since Lucasfilms decided it was a mistake. And yeah, I get it, the film bombed, but abandoning all this success, all the potential for further successes like this, that feels like throwing the space baby out with the space bathwater. But hey, Lucasfilm gonna Lucasfilm, I guess. And I think that's the only really negative thing I have to say about Solo, that inadvertently it's led to the end of performance performances like this, and ushered in the age of tech demo force ghosts. Because when you zoom out from Han, the rest of this is pretty good too. The film starts with what's almost a cold open, dropping us into the criminal underbelly of Corellia. And even though it's all a bit disconnected from the rest of the film, you know what? I don't care. This is fun. It's pulpy, but it should be. This is a Han Solo film, after all. So after some fun street racing pastiche, we're off to a war serial for a few minutes, and then into what's essentially a supercharged space age heist movie or two, before ending with a classic western finale. Or maybe a post-Western, but that's enough generic taxonomy, you get the idea. I think the middle section of the film, the stuff with Beckett and company, is probably the weakest, but it's still fun. It still revels in that hyperspeed B-movie schmaltz. We've got a crew doing jobs for a crime boss, planning the big one, and so on. There's a bit of prequelitis scattered throughout, too. In this one film, we see most of the Han Solo backstory the OT hinted at, like his meeting with Chewie, those infamous Sabacc games with Lando, and the result big spaceship. 
We also see the history behind details literally no one ever wondered about before, like the origin of the name Solo and those damn golden dice. Even at its most obnoxious though, this stuff's pretty harmless. Moreover, it's no worse than it was in the prequels. So, you know, whatever. This prequelitis does give us the Kessel Run though, which is a pretty fun set piece, and it remains fun on rewatch thanks to the character dynamics at play here. We've got Han, Becca, Chewie, but also Kira, Lando, Phoebe Waller-Bridge droid, and there's some rock-solid character work here. I really like Beckett and Kira in this film, not for any moments or lines specifically, but just because you really get the sense that they made Han Solo into the man we see in those original films. Over the course of Solo, the optimist with the heart of gold we see here gets bumped around between these two, their choices, their double crosses like a pinball, and the plays Han has to make to get through this story visibly result in a much more jaded, much more Fordian resolution for the character. These two, more than anything else, feel like the building blocks of Han's future. Saying that doesn't really do justice to Kira though, I think this is a really interesting character. You could probably even make a video on her alone. Amelia Clark kills it, and her chemistry with Ehrenreich is believable, and at times, electric. There's a pretty big part of me that preferred seeing these two on screen together than Han and Leia. That's how well these characters gel. And obviously Lando is fantastic, a silky yet dynamic performance which really captures Billy Dee Williams' charisma. Now, I'm a certified Donald Glover enjoyer. As you might be able to tell from my channel name, I'm a pretty big community fan. And I own a couple of Gambino records, so I could gush about this performance for a good while, but out of respect for TSD and to stop a bunch of you from clicking off his video during a 12 minute Donald Glover simp rant, I'll keep it quick. Suffice it to say, in a pretty stacked cast, he's consistently stealing the scene, and it's a shame we haven't got more of this character since. And if it turns out that that weird Lucasfilm decision to bury the idea of recasting classic characters is to blame for the seemingly indefinite delays to that Lando solo show, I swear to god I'll- well, I guess I won't actually do anything other than be sad, but I will be very, very sad. And hey, Paul Bettany's in this too. I'm here to see Dryden. He's expecting me. He'll be with you shortly. He's just finishing with the regional governor. <laughs> Dryden Voss isn't a franchise-defining villain by any means, but he's smarmy and menacing enough to really sell the sense of threat we're supposed to feel from the Crimson Dawn. And there's lots of other cool stuff in this vein, so many good little moments and beats that if we went through them all individually, we'd be here all day. Good luck, Han Solo. We'll have you flying in no time. But while this film does a really good job of fleshing out the character of Han Solo, of coming up with a backstory that makes sense with and maybe even adds to that original depiction, I do wonder if giving this character a fixed backstory was the right call. I know they did this in the old EU anyway, but there was something compelling, something romantic about Han's past becoming a clean slate yet again after the Disney acquisition. The idea that this roguish cad didn't have a set defined past, that he could have crawled out of any back alley or seedy establishment to become a hero is an interesting one, and that is something we lose. Solo reframes this. After seeing this prequel, it's clear that the blasé, jaded confidence man of episode 4 isn't the true original vibe of this dude. It's just a malaise he's sunken into after a decade crawling through the sludgy, morally grey underworld of the galaxy far, far away. Solo tells us that yes, he always was a rebel at heart, way before he met Luke or Leia. But I might be the only person in the whole galaxy who knows what you really are. You are the good guy. And hey, that works for me, it really does. But I'm not totally convinced that this interpretation of Han Solo should have been canonized as the definitive one. And speaking of alternative interpretations of Solo, the other shadow cast across any discussion of this movie is its troubled production. Phil Lord and Chris Miller were famously attached to this project for a long time, and then even more famously canned midway through production. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this angle because most of the discussion around this is just pure speculation, but it's interesting to to think that in some parallel universe, there's a version of this film made by the guys who put together the Lego movie and 21 Jump Street. Some reports indicate that the Lord and Miller version was more humour focused, almost improvisational at times, and while these guys are super talented filmmakers, I don't entirely blame Disney for pulling away from this. Could have turned into a real Love and Thunder-esque backlash situation. Star Wars has always had jokes, but I don't think it's a bad thing that we've never had an out-and-out -out comedy in this universe. I don't think that 
that would be a great fit with some of the kinda heavy themes going on here. And I think we do see a fraction of this tension in the film we did get. The weird way that the droid civil rights metaphor the film hints at a few times isn't ever really developed and can't ever really settle in comfortably alongside the rest of the film. But hey, these guys also made Spider-Verse, so honestly, it probably would have been fine. Either way, I'd be really interested to see any remnants of the hashtag Lord and Millicut if they ever did surface online. And at the very least, you get the sense that some of this comic energy made it through into the final product. This is a pretty funny film, and a lot of the time the jokes we do get are pretty well delivered. Are they on us? Like Ragnall on a Kylan. I, I don't know what that means. Like a Gingerson pelt. Like, are they or aren't they? Ron Howard jumped in to rescue the project after that whole mess went down, and the final result isn't flashy, doesn't push any boundaries, but it is competent and it is enjoyable. I mean, it's Ron Howard directing a Star Wars film. It was always gonna be pretty good. So is it a top five film in the franchise? Probably not. But it is clearly better than a fair few of them, and I think it interacts with the larger saga in some pretty cool ways. For instance, that much maligned release date a few months after episode eight, I don't hate that decision. The whole finale of this film, the stuff with Enfys Nest and Han's Choice, feels like a really optimistic and genuine refutation of the sort of dangerous apathy The Last Jedi explored through the character of DJ. Han's story mirrors his in a few ways, but ends by saying no. Self-interest doesn't always win. We are in this together, all of us, and sometimes, just sometimes, that message gets through. It's a really hopeful counterpoint to the thematic downer note we'd left Star Wars on, and I think in the end, that's what Star Wars is all about. Hope. Alright, that's a wrap on the solo section. What's next? Oh. Oh god. Yeah, I think I'm gonna throw it back to TSD now. I got a bad feeling about this. Okay, let's just get this over with. You may have noticed that so far, I and Pillar of Garbage have been very appreciative of the Disney Star Wars movies. They obviously have their flaws, and they aren't incredible works of art or anything, they're Star Wars movies, but I still really enjoyed them. That's not the case for Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. In fact, I think this is the only Star Wars movie, and probably one of the only movies ever, that I've seen that genuinely makes me angry. Seriously, the only movie I think I've ever gotten more upset at has been Artemis Fowl, and you know my thoughts on Artemis Fowl, probably. I've been debating with myself about how I want to approach this section in the video because, quite frankly, the prospect of talking about this movie at all is just exhausting. If I wanted to, I could absolutely go the Muller route and spend a couple of hours combing over every single thing that bothered me in this movie, but I'm not going to do that. Because one, I don't like Muller or his videos, and two, while I hinted in my fan service video that I wanted to go more in depth on this movie in the future, I just don't know if that's true anymore. I know that the culture online thrives on complaining, but I just don't always have the energy for that kind of content, unless something really, really bothers me, and it's not something as so thoroughly criticized as Star Wars Episode Nine. So you know what? I'll compromise. I'll talk about the things in this movie that I actually think it does do pretty well. And then I'll talk about why this movie doesn't work in the big picture. Like I said, there are dozens of hour-long videos detailing why this movie is such a failure. Though personally, this video about what exactly happened behind the scenes of this movie to make it what it is today is a lot more interesting to me, so I would definitely recommend that. But uh, yeah, the actual movie. Okay. I... Don't hate the Rey Skywalker thing. A lot of people act like it's the worst part of this movie, which is utterly ridiculous. I think it's rather sweet, if a bit iffy. My personal preference would have been that she just stayed as just Rey and she was able to forge her own identity outwards without having to be attached to Palpatine, but also not having to attach herself to the Skywalkers to maintain any kind of like relevance, but you know, it is what it is. Credit where credit is due, it's not the worst thing ever. I also think that Harrison Ford's cameo, while it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense within the context of the story, it is pretty, like, sweet within the bubble of what it is. There are a lot of pretty good visuals in this movie, it's not a very dull looking thing. There are some shots that I can definitely remember that stuck out to me. Again, the entire cast is putting their all into these performances. There isn't a weak point performance-wise in this movie. And of course, we can't forget easily the best part of this movie. And maybe the best part of the entire trilogy, Babu Frick. He's just a little guy. How can you not love him? He joins BB-8 in my list of funny little guys in this trilogy that I just love. All right, anything else positive to say? 
No, I don't think so. First and foremost, this movie is a result of backlash to The Last Jedi. I hinted at this a little bit in the last sequence, and if you have even caught a whiff of any kind of Star Wars discourse in the last five years, then you probably know what that was like. So it doesn't really bear repeating here. And a lot of the creative decisions in this movie seem to be focused on backtracking a lot of that movie's damage. Oh, Kylo Ren's helmet and Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber were destroyed in pretty total and very symbolic ways? Nope, they're back. Luke Skywalker tossed a lightsaber. We're gonna have to have this really cringy scene of him just saying that's for silly dum-dums. <laughs> Rose was received very poorly by audiences for very normal and not racist reasons to the point where the actress was bullied off of all of social media because of the racist and intense hatred. Now Rose is barely in the movie. All those people with very normal complaints are totally satisfied now. Rey wasn't related to any established Force user showing off that greatness can come from anywhere in the galaxy? Nope, she's Palpatine's granddaughter now. Kylo Ren was set to be the main villain of the trilogy? Nope, they resurrected a long dead and very exploded villain in the form of Palpatine to fulfill the role that Snoke would have fulfilled if he just wasn't killed off for those thematic reasons. Even if you hate The Last Jedi, you can at the very least admit that this was incredibly disrespectful to the creative vision of J.J. Abrams' alleged colleague, and detrimental to the structure of the story that he was telling. And I'm not being overdramatic, this methodology is what causes most of the problems with this movie. It takes away so much time from the actual story that's being told here. Palpatine somehow returning off screen is catastrophic to the establishment of stakes in this movie, and it sets a precedent that violent, explosive death is not enough to kill somebody. Not only does this make the ending where they totally kill Palpatine for real, guys, we promise, not mean anything at all, but it also makes it super easy for the movie to constantly fake a death one, two, three, four, five times. Five times there are fake out deaths in this movie. That combined with incredibly stupid scenes like this completely obliterates your sense of disbelief, which is an achievement for Star Wars and makes this an ultimately very boring experience. This movie also has a severe lack of respect for the characters that have been built up, either in previous sequel movies or even just previous movies in general. Rey is made to be hyper competent with almost every obstacle in the movie, and her conflict with the dark side is simplified to, my grandfather bad, and so she kills grandfather, fixing conflict, hooray. <laughs> Kylo Ren goes on some fetch quests for Palpatine, has one pep talk with his dead dad, and then becomes fully a good guy. Then he dies after kissing Rey, whoop de friggin do. But at least those two actually had character arcs to ruin in this movie. Poe and Finn are given nothing. And I mean nothing. They don't have their own arcs, they are completely incompetent and helpless, and they don't even have distinct personalities. They're just two faces to the same smart kicking sidekick character. And even looking at the slight differences they do have, there are some very unfortunate implications of making Poe, the only significant character played by a Hispanic actor, a former spice runner, which is essentially a drug runner. Yeah, great job, JJ. And I've already talked in length about my thoughts about how they handled Leia in a previous video, so I'm just gonna splice that here. To be Fair, I'll start off with what the filmmakers had the least control over. Obviously, the untimely and tragic death of Carrie Fisher. And which meant that they were very limited in what they actually could do, and so the product suffered because of factors outside of their control. That being said, they could have done a much better job. It seemed like when they were faced with the challenge of respectfully handling Leia's role in the story, they just went, let's try to squeeze as much as we can out of the footage that we have so that she can be in the movie as much as possible. And then, I don't know, have her die because in order to distract Kylo Ren enough for him to be mortally wounded by Rey and then have that mortal wound instantly healed and thus be pointless, Leia has to put all of her life force into her powers and then die. Great writing. At least in The Last Jedi, Luke doing something similar was part of his character arc, actually served a purpose by allowing the Resistance to escape, and wasn't about a recently deceased actor. All in all, the reason that this movie frustrates me so much is not just because it's bad. I don't get this angry normally at bad movies. The reason that this movie frustrates me so much is because it squanders the potential that the previous two movies had, and thus retroactively making them worse. Were The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens messy, flawed, uneven? Absolutely! But at least they were trying to tell a story that would connect with people who were watching. Whether that be through emotionally resurfacing the fans' enjoyment of the original series, or challenging the audience to think and ask questions about the work that they loved. The Rise of Skywalker isn't that. It's a product, pure and simple, and a faulty one at that. And I, for one, would be very happy if I never had to talk about it again. 
I know, I know. This is a really downer way to end the segment about the movies on the Disney era of Star Wars. So let's not end it here, shall we? Let's look at one final entry. This week, Kylo is going undercover among Star Killer base personnel as Matt. Yeah, I'm doing this. It's my video. I can do what I want. Saturday Night Live as a comedy show is very hit or miss. People are so mean, not online. The show does receive a lot of criticism, though I do believe that people my age don't really give it enough credit. Because while a lot of the sketches are real stinkers, this show has produced some of the funniest sketches I have ever seen in my entire life. Including the very first Kylo Ren undercover boss sketch. Something about placing Kylo Ren, this emotionally unstable dark space wizard, in a workplace environment is just pure comedy gold. The little bits are great. Adam Driver is a comedic genius when he wants to be. Everything from how he delivers his lines. Have you guys seen Kylo Ren's lightsaber? Yeah, man, that thing's weird looking. <laughs> no, it's not. It's awesome. Here, let me go see if I can find it. I'll show it to you. Look, I found Kylo Ren's lightsaber. Whoa. Look at it up close. To the way that he gives a thumbs up like it's the first time he's ever done it in his life just kills me. And it works on a level where it's also very in character. It doesn't really need to stray into the realm of parody to make its premise work. In fact, I actually believe that one of the people at Lucasfilm confirmed that it was canon, if I remember correctly, so that's my justification for including it. Go watch it. It's a masterpiece. The sequel, Where Are They Now, is not quite as good as the original. It's a little more reliant on topic humor, which has ceased to be topical, and repeating jokes from previous sketches, but it still does have its moments. When Kylo Ren offers Rey his hand for the second time, do you think she'll take it? Who cares? I do. I do. Okay. Also, anytime I ever see a joke about a boom mic hanging just on the edge of frame always kills me. No matter what I see it in, I am sorry. Like, it's just one of the buttons that pushes to make me laugh. Anyway, that was just a little interlude. I'm now officially done talking about the Disney Star Wars movies. And that's going to be the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed this video so much. Feel free to subscribe and check out my socials in the description below. Huge thank you to Pillar of Garbage for helping out with this video. It was a treat to have you on. I hope you're having an excellent day, and I hope that your day just continues to get better. And, uh, I guess I'll see you in the next video. Bye! They fly now! They fly now!